evening, everybody. Um, welcome to this inaugural professorial lecture of Professor John Barry. Um, I'm David Finnamore. I'm head of the School of Politics, International Studies and Philosophy, and it's my privilege to be hosting this evening's lecture. Um, as I said, welcome. Welcome to colleagues, to John's family and friends, and to a number of students in the audience as well. Um, I'm delighted, as I'm sure John is, to see you all here for an event which marks John's thoroughly deserved promotion to the rank of Professor. Um, <laughs> to John's wife, Yvonne, and to his two daughters, Sisha and Dervla, and to John's parents, Liz and Jack, as well as other members of John's family. Um, I'm sure for all of you this is a very proud day. I think for you, Liz and Jack, it must be a particularly proud occasion, um, seeing John, who 30 years ago started out on his academic career at UCD, studying, wait for it, maths, French, and economics. <laughs> Standing here now, following degrees at UCD and a PhD from the University of Glasgow as a professor of green political economy. As far as we are aware, the only professor of green political economy. I'm also delighted to be introducing the inaugural, le inaugural professorial lecture of such an established, engaged, engaging, and I think exceedingly active academic colleague. Um, I generally feel honoured. It's hosting and introducing such an occasion is undoubtedly one of the more enjoyable privileged roles that a head of school gets to perform. Most of you know John, will know John very well, and be very familiar with his ideas, with what he has written, with his interests, his passions, his politics, his enthusiasm for his teaching and research, with his activism, with his knowledge, and with his undoubted commitment to challenging conventions and engaging in debate. For those of you less familiar with John's academic work, or not fully aware how extensive it is, it can only impress. He has written, co-written, or co-edited 14 books, including most recently, The Politics of Actually Existing Unsustainability, Human Flourishing in a Climate-Changed, Carbon-Constrained World. <laughs> as well as being a co-author of the first encyclopedia in the field of environmental politics. He's also the author of over 50 chapters in edited volumes, and almost as many articles in learned journals. The range of his research interests and established expertise is equally impressive. Two areas stand out, and you will be engaging with, these, with both of these in his lecture this evening. Firstly, normative and theoretic, theoretical aspects of the politics of sustainability and sustainable development. And then secondly, the empirical and policy-related studies of the politics and economics of the transition to sustainability including work on post-growth economics and low-carbon, post-carbon energy policy. He also, I don't know where he finds the time, to be honest, conducts research and writes on contemporary politics of Ireland, Northern Ireland, generally with a focus on issues of political economy, sustainable development, and working class issues. While very much based in politics and political theory, John is an explicitly interdisciplinary scholar. So he has conducted research and published widely with colleagues both within and outside Queen's from other disciplines, ranging from engineering, environmental planning, law, to management, environmental science, philosophy, and sociology. He also has a genuinely international reputation as one of the leading global scholars in the area of green political and economic theory. Proof of his status can be found in the extensive citation of the work he's done, the invitations presented in from international conferences and workshops, his examination of PhDs which have used or engaged in his work, and a whole host of invitations to co-authors. community and civil society and policy events in Northern Ireland and beyond. And he is, as I'm sure everybody is very much aware, very active as a member of the Green Party in local politics. <laughs> what always strikes me about John as an academic colleague is his fervent and exceptionally knowledgeable interest in the topics and interests and issues he researches, and in his ability to convey his enthusiasm to others, whether students or colleagues. I think this is particularly so when it comes to issues of vital relevance to contemporary society and the future of the world in which we live. 
John never shies away from confronting his audiences with uncomfortable truths and options. In doing so, he fulfills a vitally important role of a publicly engaged academic. I think it's fair to say we will be presented with some of those uncomfortable truths this evening in what John is about to present. So, again, welcome everybody. John, many congratulations on the promotion to professor. I now invite you to present your inaugural lecture entitled Carbon Capitalism and the Transition from Unsustainability, the Challenge for Civilization in the 21st Century. John Kew. Thank you, David, and uh, great to see so, so many people here. Uh, before I begin, formally, I want to thank some people, first of all, David, for his welcome, uh, my colleagues here at Queen's and elsewhere, uh, with whom I've developed my ideas. <coughs> Second is students who've had the pleasure or horror of having me teach or supervise them, with, from whom I've learned and stolen their ideas in equal measure. To my parents, my father, for whom I have a naive commitment to honesty and telling the truth, and my mother, from whom I have my antipathy to housework. <laughs> <laughs> and probably above all, my high energy levels. And at last, my immediate family, my daughter Saoirse and Dervla, whose future animates much of my academic and political work to help create a better world for them. And finally, my wife Yvonne, my partner, with whom I share credit. <laughs> she has suffered patiently my frequent absences, and as a constant reminder to me that there are more important things to life than politics, and life is not a seminar. <laughs> This is a night of firsts. It's the first time many of you perhaps see me not just wear a suit, but that I do possess a pair of long trousers. <laughs> I'm dressing tonight because of my political adage of always dressing to the right and voting to the left. <laughs> but perhaps this might also be the first professorial Nobel lecture given by somebody who's technically an industrial action. More that later. <laughs> I offer you here tonight... I offer you here tonight the reverse of the old adage that as one gets older, one's waist gets thicker as one's mind gets thinner. Well, I've certainly fulfilled the waist bit. But I find myself more radical now than I was when I started off 30 odd years ago under the supervision of Professor John Baker here from University College Dublin and my master's dissertation on limits to growth. I hope to confuse, amuse and provoke you in equal measure tonight and to encourage you all that you should perhaps in a small measure be like me and become radical in how we trans make the transition to a more sustainable economy. So some intellectual health and safety warnings before I begin. I won't read these out. These are my instruction manuals to myself when I teach, particularly the first one. Exaggeration is when the truth loses its temper. And the last one, and I will have some thing to say in terms of what I think are the obligations of the academic in this time of crisis and great change. As privileged knowledge workers, how are we applying our knowledge to our community? How are we making the world a better place? And most importantly, <laughs> because I'll be spending quite a bit of time on critiquing what I think is a cancer in modern society of not just capitalism, but another C, consumerism. Just to let you know. <laughs> Are you all sitting comfortably? Then I'll begin. I begin from the position of being an environmentalist, which is the crazy idea that we should clean up after ourselves and pass on the world in a better state than that which we found it. Everything I give you tonight has been said by Dr. Zeus. <laughs> the original film, not the one that came later. I speak for the trees. But is green the new red? And that will be part of what I'll be looking at in terms of some of the older ideas of social justice, of social transformation, of class, of inequality, most of which have fallen off the political agenda. I think I've come back with a greater relevance now in dealing with issues of unsustainability. And this is what we're dealing with. A vision from Mordor, if the Canadian tar sands 
goes ahead. A vision of our future on a planet that we're frying. Hence our rather clement weather we have here this evening. This is all part <laughs> of the projections for climate change for this part of the world. A world that's literally dripping in oil and blood for oil, as I'll point out. And we're essentially degrading the planet's resources quicker than it could sustain and regenerate. We are living in a thoroughly unsustainable world. And I'll make the claim that that's what we should begin from. Not arguments for sustainability, but arguments for unsustainability. And this sustainability comes in different shapes and sizes. This is a map adjusted in terms of world military spending. The money required to eradicate poverty and hunger. Just in terms of the other dimension of what you might call social unsustainability. Where are we putting those creative human talents, the collective labour, our technologies in terms of sustaining life as opposed to finding better ways to kill each other? And a question I find myself asking again and again. Why is there always money for war and yet we can't eradicate poverty or find the money for education? And is green, therefore, the new red? We are on a ship. This is the good ship, Karl Marx. And whether or not is it towards a Marxism that we need to go back to or reinvigorate in the 21st century to at least chart some of the problems, if not agree completely with all the prognoses and diagnoses and solutions that classical Marxism had identified in terms of the problems of capitalism. It has also been seen by the opponents of environmentalism and green politics, of which my colleague James McCarroll uh, from North Down Border Council will probably testify that I'm regularly accused of on North Down Council. I think it is my habit of calling everybody comrade, might give it away. <laughs> And I do think that this is a common view of green politics. And my answer to this is, so what? If green is the new red, what is the issue in terms of that perhaps being the framework within which we have to look at sustainability? This is probably an image of me. This is the watermelon green. Green on the outside and red in the middle. <laughs> But the context that we're looking at this issue of the transition from unsustainability is the proliferation, zombie economics, of dead ideas, capitalist economics, or to give it a more technical term, neoclassical economics, which have comprehensively failed, failed to predict the global economic crisis of 2007, 2008, failed to find solutions beyond bailing out the banks, which is the socialism of the rich, a private sector financial crisis, I'm looking at my colleague Andrew Baker to see if he's nodding to see if I'm getting this right, a private sector banking crisis becomes with a slate of hand into a public sector funding crisis. And that's the context in which we face another dimension of unsustainability. I'm using this image up here as reference to how consumerism was based upon debt. And that was the great engine of the pre-crash model. And in many respects, most political parties, the dominant analysis of our economic crisis is rather like Dorothy in the Wizard of Oz clicking her ruby red slippers. Get us back to 2008, back to 2008, back onto consumption and consumerism. And whether or not that is the model that we have to go back to. But I also think, no relation, Wendell Berry's comment here I think is very opposite in terms of the, the deep ethical and political choices that we have as a society. Our leaders have the courage to send our young people off to war, often war for resources or oil, but not the courage to face us, the polis, our people, and say, let's rein in our overconsumption. Let's try and find a new economic model and a new vision of human flourishing. And most of what I have to say to you is based on this book here I wrote two years ago that David mentioned. I think this is very telling. This is an installation in Berlin of politicians talking about climate change. 
And we're coming up to yet another eco-diplomacy in Paris in terms of whatever deal can be made. And there's some good news today in terms of China and America coming to some interim agreement between themselves in terms of cutting carbon. But I begin, and what's animated all my academic work and indeed my political activism is a deep sense of injustice and railing against the injustices of the world. I'm trying to figure out what's the cause of that. That's why I always talk about unsustainability. I know it doesn't trip off the tongue, but to me it is the condition in which we live. Just as it is in injustice, rather than justice as the state of the world, it's unsustainability, not sustainability, is the situation that we exist in. But yet the vast majority of the scholarship in my area, which is a fairly modest area when I began 30 years ago, it's now massively uh, increased, a lot more sophistication, technical detail and empirical evidence, was always about sustainability and sustainable development. And my view is that sustainability beckons to the future of some ideal sustainable relationship between humans and the natural world and a just relationship within human society, whereas unsustainability calls our attention to the present harms that are going on within society and the harms being perpetrated on the non-human world. Now, of course, they are related, but I think we do need to begin from recognising the priority of unsustainability. And I'm, while I am a radical, I'm an evidence-based radical, who certainly believes that the perfect, the sustainable, shouldn't become the enemy of the good. How do we make society less unsustainable? And for me, they invariably go hand in hand. Usually, unsustainability between humans and nature is evidence, other things being equal, of an injustice within human society with nature as the tool by which this is perpetrated. So in, injustice and unsustainability, to me, are inextricably linked. I think that language of justice, and many of you here come from the political world, the activist world, or the academic world, where we know the power of injustice. The language of justice and injustice is the most powerful ethical language that we have to articulate our claims. So when somebody makes a claim of justice or injustice, we know it's a very serious issue in terms of using that particular moral language. And the reality here is, just to get a bit technical, is that the struggle against injustice is not necessarily the same as the positive struggle for some conception of justice. And I quote here from the political philosopher Thomas Simon. It's got a different phenomenology, justice and injustice. And I would certainly agree with the bit I bolded there, is that injustice should take priority over justice. And yet most of political theory, certainly since the 1960s, has been, to use the most famous book to come out in post-war political philosophy, A Theory of Justice by John Rawls. Uh, and not actually attending to the, in my view, sufficiently the issues of injustice. So for me, um, explaining where I've come from, that I believe green politics, green political theory and economy must begin from this perception and activism around challenging injustice and unsustainability. And therefore, challenging unsustainability should take priority over coming up with some new green print or, or green print or blueprint of a just society. Some of the dangers of asking too many questions and being too radical to get to the root of an issue. <coughs> what this means, though, is that the critique of how unsustainable and unjust our contemporary society and economy actually is does not have to depend on some positive conception of a perfectly just and sustainable world. <coughs> now, while, of course, and I speak here partly as a political activist and a politician, you can win people over and it's strategically important to present them with a vision of the good, the sustainable and the just. From my point of view, normatively, ethically, you do not need a positive conception of justice or sustainability in order for your critique of unsustainability and injustice to hold true. Again, to quote Thomas Simon, the negative recommendation stands on its own. You cannot dismiss a critique of injustice under capitalism. You cannot condemn and dismiss a critique of the inequality, the unsustainability under capitalism by simply saying, ah, where's your perfect solution? The identification of harms is sufficient 
in order to mobilise action and should be listened to and taken seriously. So what's the cause of all this injustice and unsustainability? Exhibit one, my lord, capitalism. I adopt, for those of you who know this area, which maybe about three of us in the room, Karl Polanyi's wonderful book, The Great Transformation, about the disembedding, that capitalism represents historically the disembedding of the human economy to the market, which is simply set by the self-regulating processes of prices, and disembedding the human economy from the environment, but most importantly, disembedding the human economy from social norms and indeed government regulation as this process of disembedding speeds up under neoliberalism in the last 30 years or so. And particularly as an academic, it, it pains me greatly, to say the least, to think that the economic learning, the imaginary, how we imagine the economy is, how we construct it, the models we build from it, the prognosis of how the economy should be organised, in learned institutions like universities is extremely poor extremely poor. When I was an undergraduate economic student in UCD in the 1980s, we were at least given, although very badly, because he then went on to become um, very important in the PDs, political demo progressive Democrats down south, but we were taught at least Marxist economics, or laborious economics, as this particular lecture used to call it. We were given some sense of the history of economics and political economy, that the roots of modern economics lie in theology, in ethics, in morals, that Adam Smith was not a right-wing nut job whose only legacy to the world of politics and academia is a rising tide raises all boats or the wealth of nations. I don't know if James perhaps agree with me. In the Scottish Enlightenment tradition in which Smith was writing, he wrote the theory of moral sentiments prior to writing uh, the theory of um, the wealth of nations in that he understood that the importance of embedding the economy and economic norms couldn't be left to themselves. But what we have in the modern academic community, in my view, is a dominant view of economics, with a dominant view of the human being at the centre of a homo economicus, a selfish, self-maximising, self-actualising, independent, rapacious, consumptive human being. This is not to say that we are not at times some of those things. Certainly I am consumptive when there's alcohol involved. <laughs> but the point is, this is only a partial view of the human being. We are so much more than this particular image that we get under what I'm calling here neoclassical economics. Yet this is what we are producing in the academy right across the Western world. Thousands of what I would call technically competent barbarians Students who come out with a view of economics, that is capitalist economics, because they know no other. They've not been taught feminist economics. They have no sense at all of the history of economics. So in which they, they come out and simply see themselves as managers of a system, and above all else, and nothing riles me more than a man kicking my mule, than an economist who pretends they are objective. <coughs> As if economics is not as value-laden as Marxism, as feminism, as conservatism, as nationalism. Economics pretends, to a sleight of hand, that it is value-free. There is no value-free economics. Everything is political economy. The economy is intrinsically connected to issues of power, property relations, the conditions under which we organise our productive capacities, we distribute and we consume. So there is no such thing, in my view, as value-free economics. But particularly in a society and an institution like the academy where we prize variety, we prize pluralism, we prize debate, we don't see any debate around economics. And this is not to say that my version of economics, grim political economy, is the correct one, although of course it is. But I'm just <laughs> saying, I'm not saying necessarily that is the only option we have, but let's have the debate between the neoclassical economist, the feminist economist, the Marxist, the eco-Marxist, the Keynesian, the post-Keynesian. So it is the weaker element of my argument here is really just about pluralism. Where do we see the debate? 
and particularly telling, we no longer have at Queen's a school or department of economics. We have a management school. I rest my case. And part of the problem why I'm so down on capitalism is that it's addicted to economic growth as a structural condition. This is not to say that all capitalists and entrepreneurs are somehow sitting like a James Bond villain, sitting in a high back chair stroking a cat saying, how can I wreck the planet and exploit workers on the way? Well, there may be a few of those, but I don't think that necessarily is an accurate description even of you know, high wealth entrepreneurs. This is a structural issue that the capitalist economy has to go or grow or collapse. It's like a bicycle, although not as sustainable. The issue is that what I'm calling here orthodox, undifferentiated economic growth as a permanent feature of the human economy, I'll come back to this, is the primary policy goal of most states, most parties, most governments, and indeed most citizens accept this as a common sense. And I want to return to that notion of the common sense, that this is the only option we have available to us. But here's the thing, from a scientific point of view, whether you look at ecological degradation or the carbon intensity in the atmosphere which is causing climate change, there's a fundamental contradiction between a growing capitalist economy using more resources, more energy causing more pollution, and the non-negotiable ecological limits of the planet. But it wasn't bad enough, this economic growth also, in the Western world at least, we have some evidence to suggest it's past the point where it's adding to our well-being. Economic growth has now become uneconomic growth. Growth for its own sake is the ideology of the cancer cell. And I would say that in the Western world, certainly, we have now passed into the stage of cancerous growth. It wasn't as bad as that. The final issue with economic growth, if you're an egalitarian, which I certainly am, I don't know what everybody in the audience is, but I presume quite a proportion perhaps would be, if you're an egalitarian and you're concerned about the issues of inequality and injustice in our society, economic growth is not perhaps often the best way of eradicating or dealing with that. Because economic growth manages and requires socioeconomic inequality rather than eradicating it, which I'll give you some evidence in a moment. So, some basic sustainability. The human economy is a subsystem of the larger ecosystem. Everything that human beings have ever made ever done, exchange, has been a combination of using human labour, ingenuity, in conjunction with natural resources. The planet isn't growing. So how can a subsystem of a non-growing larger system continually grow? And from a technical point of view, the capitalist economy has to grow by at least 3% per annum just to stay still. What that means, folks, is every 25 years, it doubles. So it sounds very modest, 3% a year. But if you stretch it out, we're talking about the doubling of the economy, resources, energy, pollution, every 25 years. This is the human economy here. We get resources in, wastes come out. If that grows, we get more resources in, more wastes out. And so there's a fundamental, illogical connection between a growing subsystem and a larger system that does not grow. And what we're in now is a state of global ecological overshoot. Although it varies, sometime around the mid-90s or late uh, 1980s, we passed as a species the point beyond which we are actually uh, staying within the planet's biocapacity. That's its capacity to regenerate and maintain resources maintain a functioning ecosystem. We're in overshoot. We're in ecological debt. We've gone into the red since the last 30 years or so. And while we are, as I say here, using the Earth's capital rather than income, so one example of this would be in terms of energy, solar radiation is a form of income. We get that all the time, every day. Capital, on the other hand, is something like oil, coal, or gas, which should all be properly seen as ancient sunlight. Oil, coal, and gas are ancient sunlight that's been captured through processes over millions of years. It's a form of capital because once you burn up a bag of coal, 
or a gallon of oil, it ain't coming back around at any time scale that's meaningful for human beings. Unlike the wind, wave, water power, which are renewable in terms of uh, this issue of being income as opposed to capital. And if we keep going the way we're going, as the Chinese saying puts it, we're going to get to where we're headed. If we stay on our current trajectory of energy, materials, consumption, growth, including population growth, this is the business as usual, we're getting more and more into ecological debt. And this is not evenly distributed. Essentially, you can define sustainability as one planet living, but if people are living way beyond their allotted share, I mean, somebody somewhere else is not getting their fair share. Northern Ireland, taken as a whole, is living a 2.5 planet lifestyle. In other words, if everybody in the world is to live like us, to live in Northern Ireland, we need to, another planet and a half to sustain the resources and to absorb the pollution. So what we have to do is not go on this path and start peak and then gradually get back to a sustainable level. And ideally, to actually start building up some ecological reserves. We are rivet popping the life-sustaining systems of the planet and we're calling it progress. And this is unevenly distributed in terms of the development that all of this frantic activity in a global capitalist system produces. So we have the northern world, internet users, and deaths by often preventable starvation, completely the opposite. We live in a profoundly unjust, as well as a profoundly unsustainable world. This adjusted map here is showing where, who are the culprits in degrading the natural life-supporting systems of the planet. It isn't people in Africa, generally, or even India. In comparison, look at Britain and Ireland in terms of our overuse of the world's resources. So I put it to you that we do have a population problem. Too many rich, fat Europeans and North Americans. Given that we, in the minority world, of Europe, Australasia and Japan are using up way more resources and causing more pollution, climate change and so on than comparable populations on the planet. And here is our dilemma. Our good environmentalist respectfully saying since the late 1960s we think there's a problem. There's a cliff down there, don't go down it. And you could say well, all the reports we've had since then, I mean, it's been raining reports for 40 years telling us there's a major problem in terms of these limits, these ecological limits to growth. And we could be the first species to accurately document our own demise in terms of the reports. We don't need any more reports. In fact, we don't need any more technology, I would suggest as well, in terms of dealing with this transition from unsustainability. Because effectively our economy is killing the planet. We're rivet popping the life support systems of the planet and calling it progress. And a quote there from Tim Jackson from 2008. And this is what's animated me for the last decade and probably will for the rest of my academic career of trying to figure out if this system is unsustainable and unjust, well, what replaces it? Because we never had to create an economy which had to be so conscious of energy flows. And with due deference to uh, colleague Dr. Robin Curry, we need, in his words, to become carbon literate. And I think that's what we're at now. The issue of the literacy of our economic system and indeed of citizens in terms of looking at flows of carbon and energy as an important part of looking at the economy, not just flows of money and employment. You may say, oh, that's terribly doom and gloom, John. What about technology? It'll solve our problem. And I am not a Luddite. I do believe in technological innovation can uh, begin to help us in this transition from unsustainability. But I reject comprehensively the myth of decoupling. The idea that we can still have all the goodies that we have. Simon Cowell, X Factor, iPhone 6 that bends in your back pocket, YouTube, internet, pears from Guatemala flown in. 
The idea that we can have that lifestyle that's extremely high carbon, high energy, and high in pollution by decoupling it is a myth. But it's a very comforting myth. Because what this does is allows us to continue with our continuing unsustainable way of life without having to really change anything. These are figures from Tim Jackson. This is the trend growth, of the, it's a bit old now, 2007, of the connection, the absolute connection, causal connection between coal, CO2, gas, oil, and world GDP. Literally, carbon fuels the capitalist economy. So in terms of gigatons of carbon intensity and uh, dollars, we're at this stage in 2007. <coughs> Now, according to the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which recently uh, released its uh, latest assessment report, we need to get down here. So we're up here at the minute in terms of carbon mm. intensity. If we want to stay below a two-degree increase in global average temperature, which is probably the, the, the highest level we can go to stay within a safe operating space for humanity, I think we're not going to make it. And we're now into the scenario of an above two degree increase, which can lead to runaway climate change. Anyway, so we have to get from here down to here. Now, if we do that in terms of technology, what that means is it's a factor of 130 improvement. This is science fiction. To think that we can get from there to there by only dealing in technology and production at some point, we're going to have to challenge consumption. That's the real inconvenient truth of a lot of the message of unsustainability. We cannot innovate and use technology to get us out of these problems. And as I'll come back towards the end of my talk, these type of technological solutions not only continue with business as usual, they also rob us of the ethical and political opportunity to reshape the world. <coughs> That's why it's called business as usual. So what we have to do is, I think, imagine a life beyond economic growth. But this is the act here, as Tim Jackson goes on to say, of lunatics, idealists, and revolutionary. I'm all three. But I've got a professor in front of me name. <laughs> and for me, what's interesting in terms of the, the, the sociological, the cultural, Indeed, you could say the psychological importance of economic growth, because normally growth is good. Growth means maturation. It means development. But the point, and I go back to this rather <coughs> provocative statement, that that's what cancer is. Cancer are cells that have grown beyond the threshold that they are healthy for the host. So in other words, growth continually is not healthy, as I only know too well. The issue here is how do we get negative feedback mechanisms of where do we introduce the notion of sufficiency, of enough, rather than maximisation. But this challenging growth is tantamount to a betrayal in our society. To challenge growth, you're seen as betraying society because our societies are based upon the idea of continual economic growth. Or to use a rather provocative phrase, and I could have only come up with this from living in Northern Ireland of disloyalty. You are a disloyal citizen for arguing against economic growth. And we've known this. Famous Limits to Growth report, 1972, or Tim Jackson's in 2009, and many, many reports in between based on science, just looking at the scientific evidence of the accumulation of unsustainability in the system. So therefore I get, I get three reasons for why I'm critical of growth. It's clearly unsustainable, this process of continual economic growth. It doesn't deal with inequality in society, it manages inequality. And as I said, it also has passed the point where it's not actually contributing in the overdeveloped world, the minority world of Europe, Australasia and Japan we don't need more growth. You know, we need more redistribution. Northern Ireland is an incredibly rich society. Unfortunately, it's all out in Kultra. It's in the wrong place. So why don't we bring down to the village 
where if the weather gets cold, there are people who might have to make the awful decision to feed themselves or heat themselves. And yet we have people living in tremendous opulence just down the road from me. And that really is the old issue of socialism, of Marxism, of radicals, to say, what's wrong with this picture? We are an incredibly rich society. Why are we wanting more growth? Growth is not what's needed. Growth is needed in Africa, in Asia, in China, to bring people out of poverty. We have a million, sorry, a billion members of the human family living on less than a dollar a day. That's where growth should be. We have already passed a point where growth is no longer aiding us in terms of our fulfillment of human flourishing. So this then leads to three criteria to assess economic policy. If it's low carbon, if it increases rather than decreases, sorry, if it increases inequality, we don't want it. If it decreases inequality, it can be normatively accepted. And does it add or take away from human flourishing? So this is not a, it's not a blanket criticism of economic growth. You can have pro-poor economic growth. You can have different models of orthodox economic growth. The classic one being, of course, the Scandinavian economies with high levels of social security, high levels of taxes, of course. But there are forms of economic growth that are less inequitous than some of the ones we've suffered in the Anglo-Saxon world. But then, and with due deference both to John Woods and, and Peter Doran and mm -hmm. some others who've done some work on this area of GDP, you know, are we measuring the right thing? Because what gets measured gets done. And our societies, our economic system, our political parties are obsessed with GDP economic growth. And GDP is simply a measure of all goods and services produced within a country. It includes things like beer, bicycles, education. I wouldn't recommend combining these two, as happened to me <laughs> once upon a time while at Keele University. But this also adds to GDP. Divorce, ching ching! Pollution, wars, all of these add to GDP. Negatives, I would say. We don't want more divorce in society. We want to certainly reduce pollution, and we don't want any more wars. Yet this adds to GDP. And what doesn't GDP measure? The feminized, gender unequal, reproductive labor and work that goes on in the home. That's not included in our GDP figures. Community activism, the convivial economy, uh, of people getting together and exchanging, exchanging and trading and working together about the use of money, doesn't get counted. Our democratic work as citizens, to keep alive the ideals of living in a free and equal society, that doesn't count in our GDP figures. So it seems to me, if this measure of GDP doesn't measure the good stuff, why are we still building our economies around it? Why are our citizens getting a daily diet in the media of this constant encouragement to us, to our hearts to sing or to drop if GDP is up or down? So what we need to do is get beyond this particular orthodox method. And this post-growth vision that I'm articulating, it is consistent with some sectors of the economy growing. I personally want to see more libraries, more kidney dialysis machine, more support for dancing. The mag's burn here. I want less money for weapons. I want less money for bad things, you could say, in, in society. So a non-growing or a post-growth economy is consistent with some sectors of the economy growing and others shrinking. It's a political decision. So we get back, this is political economy. Not that it's somehow automatically given by fiat. And again, this is not particularly new. This is Robert Kennedy in 1968 at a commencement speech, uh, shortly before he was assassinated. I think he put it very elegantly and eloquently of what's wrong with the GDP measure. In fact, if I had longer, I could bore you even more with some of the Foucauldian work I've done in looking at the origins of GDP and my argument that GDP lies in the mid-war period of the 1920s and 1930s, and Tom here might put me right, it measures the war-fighting capacity of a nation. That's what it was originally created to do. It was never set up, even by one of its greatest 
uh, um, originators, Simon Kuznets, he even said that this GDP measure was not a measure of social welfare or how well society was doing. It was a technical measure, in one case, the war fighting capacity of society, but the measurement of goods and services traded in an economy. It's time to move beyond GDP as well as pre uh, economic growth. But even more provocatively, provocatively, if your heads aren't melted enough, the economy growing tells us nothing about the quality of economic activity. More people smoking and dying and having to access services because of it, that adds to GDP. So just looking at the GDP figure growing tells us nothing about the quality of economic activity. And the point also, rather provocatively from the New Economics Foundation, is that even in times of austerity and economic crisis, Health and well-being, aspects of health and well-being can increase. In other words, there's no correlation necessary between orthodox GDP, health, human flourishing, and well-being. And if you're interested, there's a local example of this. Is that a report was done by the ONS, the uh, Organization for National Statistics in the UK, and they showed that I think it was of the five top quality of life places in the UK, three or four of them were in Northern Ireland. And yet our economy is often seen as a basket case. We have to rebalance the economy because the public sector is too big. We don't have enough foreign direct investment coming in. Too many small to medium enterprises and so on. So if our economy is such a basket case, why is it that we have recorded very high levels of quality of life? That's a paradox, one that I, I hope to embark upon in terms of trying to research it. Is it as glib? that, well, we're all so happy we're not killing each other anymore. And I won't dismiss that, but here we are now, 15, 16 years after the agreement. Is there something else? Has it got to do with our high levels of social capital? In reference to Dr. Simon Briggs, Professor Simon Briggs, sorry, in, in the audience. Has it got to do with our levels of conviviality, which can be often horribly sectarianised, of course. You know, we've got a bonding capital between us, not a lot of bridging often. But it's a conundrum. Why is it that the Northern Ireland economy, seen as such a basket case, actually tends to produce high levels of quality of life, according to this particular survey? And this is, if I can make a contribution to the academy, it's, it's this phrase, is questioning the idea of undifferentiated. So we have to differentiate. Do we want prostitution in our economy? Well, maybe not. So right, we want to differentiate that, even if it's legalised or not. Do we want to have war making as part of the economy that we're going to measure? Do we want to see that we have to make awful choices between spending money on better ways to kill each other as opposed to sustain our lives? So we have to get smarter in terms of differentiating which bits of the economy do we want to grow and why? And that cannot be answered technically. That is not a technical question. That's a moral and political issue. But it's also about questioning economic growth as a permanent feature of the economy. I am perfectly willing and happy to accept that growth historically has led us to the affluent societies that we have today. But to say that we continue on this path when it's long past the point of being ecologically sustainable, that it adds to human flourishing, or that it reduces and, and uh, starts to ameliorate the inequalities in society is an issue we haven't really begun yet. What this means then, to go back to the point I made earlier about carbon literacy, we're going to have to set up new systems of accounts where we're measuring and tracking flows of, of resources, of pollution, of carbon. And we have many of these models uh, already, but they're just not being scaled up or been implemented or promoted to citizens that this is the new economy. What we're facing here, in my view, is a paradigm shift. We're at that moment of crisis from which a paradigm shift needs to occur. But I've been saying this for 30 years. The issue is, we're saying it louder, we've got better statistics, we have more reports, but still the politicians, but also citizens don't want to listen. And there's an issue there about how you present this in terms of a compelling, attractive vision to live in a different type of society. The other reason why economic growth on the capitalism is unjust and unsustainable is because of this myth of trickle-down economics, which I think John Kenneth Galbraith 
put it most succinctly. This is the justification for inequalities. The titans of industry and finance, they'll be taxed modestly. Or if you're Google, maybe you can negotiate with the Irish government and get it down to really, really low. And that will then pass on to little people. Because only little people pay taxes. And in fact, if the UK government has its way, we'll have less tax inspectors. In fact, that's the one thing that could help us get out of this crisis. <laughs> Invest more in tax inspectors. Close up those offshore loopholes that allow large corporations and high wealth individuals to avoid tax. And Bono, move you two's accounts back to Ireland, not Holland. This is one for you, Mum. This is Shopaholic. And really, again, and I'm using these historical 60s, 70s, and then bringing them up to date with some more to show you this has been around a long time. There's a quote there from uh, Wallach from 1972 is that the promise of growth acts as a substitute for equality. And it's probably best expressed in the myth, and it is a myth because it had to be asleep to believe it, of the American dream that everybody who works hard can succeed and become a millionaire. And it's a really interesting political, sociological, or cultural point that in America, and the evidence is there in terms of social surveys, even poor people will not want to see taxes on millionaires for the reason that they really believe, why would I tax my son or daughter, or perhaps even myself? It's an outlier. In most other countries, poorer people tend to want more taxes on the broadest shoulders and so on. And I think Herman Daly, who in one respect is a, the grandfather of green economics, uh, puts it there. So you don't need equality because a bigger cake is better for you. You can have an absolute share that's bigger rather than a more relative share of a smaller cake, but it's more equally divided. And more recently, a book that many of us uh, have read, certainly in the Academy and, and elsewhere, uh, The Spirit Level. And what they argue in that book, this is Wilkinson and Pickett, who are you know, epidemiologists who are looking at the statistics in terms of health and obesity and tracking that against measures of Gini coefficients of, of inequality and so on, is that they say inequality drives consumerism and competition because of the status uh, competition that's involved. You live in a more unequal society. How you dress, how you look, are you wearing the right clothes matters much more. You know, I'm stepping outside that tonight and I'm actually dressed half decently. But it is a sad reality that children in our schools are being bullied. Many of you heard me say this before, not because of the horrible reasons that I grew up with. You had glasses, you had ginger hair, you had freckles or whatever. Children are terribly cruel, aren't they, Derbla? <laughs> but they're being bullied because they're not wearing the Nike top or the Donna Karen New York shoes or the Jimmy Shoe shoes. We've created a culture in which our young people feel bad about themselves over the goods that they may not be able to afford. And this is perfectly in line with Wilkinson and Pickett's argument that a more unequal society leads to this situation. I think the importance of shame, that sense of shame, that you find in many houses, often in poorer areas of Belfast, you go downstairs and they'll have the IKEA furniture, the 70-inch flat screen television, and nothing else in the house. Because that's what's seen to be a normal member of our society in terms of status. And actually psychologically, this is one for my wife Yvonne who's a psychologist, is that inequality increases status competition which causes consumerism. You know, normal, healthy, self-respecting adults do not typically go on consumer binges or feel that they have to live their lives through the accumulation uh, of more and more goods. So more inequality, you have these notions of inferiority and superiority within society. There's insecurity in terms of how people feel, how they present themselves, and we're more worried about how people judge us because we're not wearing the right clothes. And this is as a causal, not, not correlation, it's a causal connection with socioeconomic inequality. Sorry, no, I'm going to wrap up soon. And all this brings back to me how in the condition of wealth and affluence 
This neoliberal or capitalist model has to perpetuate the myth of constant scarcity. There's never enough. In the midst of plenty, where the real debate should be around redistribution, we are fed a constant diet in the media, in public policy, in our political debate, the idea of this constant bogey person of scarcity. And for me, this is a mythic uh, construction. We often think that because we live in a world with the internet and the iPhone, that we're not prone to myths. I would say that economic growth is the modern myth by which we, we live. We have this idea of perpetual scarcity. There's no serious debate about how can we democratically regulate certain limits, or certainly certain needs and wants in favour of others. And just as an example of this, this is data from 1970 to 2010. So you get reported levels of happiness in the UK, they're kind of bumping along, so people are basically the same, going across decades. We have the economy going up, more or less. Of course there's been bumps and grinds in terms of recessions and depressions. Or a more graphic representation. So there's GDP, and here's life satisfaction. So all that growth, all that frantic activity of consumerism, of energy, of pollution, of resources, hasn't appreciably added to self-reported levels of life satisfaction. Well, why don't we design public policy for this bit? This is only a proxy, or at times it can be a necessary means, but why are we focusing all our energies on orthodox economic growth rather than life satisfaction and human flourishing? And particularly for me, one of the intrinsic elements of the modern capitalist system is debt-based consumerism, excessive consumption as a weapon of mass distraction. It's called the rat race for a reason. And this is essentially the model that we have in our economy. Whoever dies with the most stuff wins. <laughs> And for me, I think we need to come up with a different model of human flourishing than the one that we have on offer within consumer capitalism. And this is my own contribution, what I call negative Aristotelianism. Don't bother yourselves too much <laughs> trying to figure out exactly what that means. But what it is, is that I think we can identify quasi-objective features of a good human life. And this scares a lot of liberals, because it means that, are you promoting a singular view of the good life? Well, I'm not. It's about the removing of those barriers preventing people to live decent, flourishing lives, of which I believe there's a range. There is only just one good life. And it is about, as I mentioned here, the speedy reduction of the features that are preventing people from choosing these options to fulfill their capabilities to live a human, uh, flourishing life. So I think we can specify aspects of the context in which people live that are actively undermining living in crappy accommodation being constantly told that you're stupid I mean, these are some of the easy features we can identify that are preventing people from living uh, high quality lives but this is where I differ from a lot of the work, or some of the work on happiness and well-being. I have the rather, it could be heretical, but I think it's a realistic and normatively compelling vision that human flourishing, this is why I'm an Aristotelian in that sense, is not the same as being blissed out and happy all the time, kind of eudaimonia. I do believe that death, sickness, uh, and the recognition of our vulnerabilities are all part of what it means to live a good human life. And it is something that is rather worrying that we have a undue focus in our Western culture on vitality and youth and perfection. Whereas actually that is not always accurate as a description of human beings. And I think particularly in Western culture, we have a difficulty in recognizing dependency and interdependency on each other. Even in liberal political theory, the ideal is the autonomous, the independent, typically male, who are removed from the dependencies of child caring, of looking after the old and the sick. So I'm not celebrating 
vulnerability, but it is a recognised that vulnerability and dependency is an ineliminable condition of what it means to be human. It has to be acknowledged and recognised. And I also think that in most public policy, even in political theory, the vision of the human being as independent, as able-bodied, as being unencumbered by dependency is of a snapshot. It's typically a youthful individual before they get married, independent, able to go out and work 24-7 and party and so on. That's the kind of the image of the human being that we often get presented. That's what economics in particular presents. Whereas if you view the human being over the course of a lifespan, there are times when we're sick, when we're vulnerable, when we have to look after other relatives. Yet that's not factored in often to the image of the human being that we get in political theory and certainly not in economics. And McIntyre, whose politics would be kind of different to mine, Alistair McIntyre, I think he at least had the good grace uh, in a book to recognise that this is something that even he had in his own work, and he's one of the preeminent political philosophers in certainly Western theory, where we, did, we don't recognise vulnerability uh, in how we even think as political theorists. <coughs> and all this leads then, I'm not going to surprise you, that I do think we have to start thinking about notions of human flourishing beyond consumerism. Finding time for the simple things in life. And I speak against myself as always, as Yvonne reminds me, here's somebody promoting green politics, quality of life, and actively not having one in terms of at one stage, and I don't know whether Saoirse put Derbla up to it, at, around the breakfast table, Derbla says, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> but the issue here is that this movement towards a more simple life, voluntary simplicity, having less things, being mindful, as uh, Peter Doran uh, constantly reminds me, requires some degree of economic security. And I'm going to use here the International Labour Organization's definition. This is to replace economic growth. And it's the bits in bold I want you to focus on. The most important determinant of, natural, of national happiness is not income level. There is a positive association, but it trails off. The key factor is the extent of income security through public policy and income protection, and particularly a low degree of inequality. In other words, if we want to promote economic security, we need to basically make our societies less unequal and provide extensive forms of social protection and income protection. So my, pro my prognosis or my proposition is to replace economic growth with economic security. One way of doing this, and again, John Baker and Tony Weeks and others have done a lot of work, certainly on the island of Ireland, of promoting a basic income scheme as one way of getting us there to a less unsustainable economy. It certainly would achieve reducing inequality. It would certainly enhance human freedom to be freed from the compulsion of taking a crappy, low-paid, non-unionised job out of economic compulsion. Basic income would at least remove that uh, as a distortion of what it means to be free. But also, I think, free up the area of the economy that's often the Cinderella in our economic imaginary of the social economy. We usually have the public sector and the private sector. What about the social economy? Which I think a lot of the sustainable, life-enhancing, human flourishing providing opportunities actually lie within the social economy. And why not tax the rich? And get away from income and attack, start uh, attacking or taxing assets and wealth and not just income. What about reducing the working week? It's always been a constant puzzle to me is that why such an intelligent species as ours, with our technological ingenuity, certainly since the Industrial Revolution, every technological revolution has led to less people working more rather than more people working less. Again, Your Honour, capitalism in the dock in terms of the reasons for that. Why don't we start seriously considering and modelling how can we redesign the economy around the New Economics Foundation idea of reducing the average working week to 20 hours? And to realise the productivity gains of technological innovation in terms of more free time rather than more stuff and more income. And therein becomes the political bargain that has to be attended to. But all of this requires greater flexibility, certainly more gender justice in terms of childcare and looking after issues in the home, and what I'm talking about here is more meaningful free time, not 
unemployment rather than more stuff. Or more radically, why don't we democratise the workplace? And I see Mel Corrie is here, and I know others are here from Trademark, a workers' cooperative. Or democratise, allow workers even in non-cooperatively organised workplaces to have more say. And this is a challenge for those of you who are trade unionists. Why don't we see the trade unions arguing for more power to workers in the workplace rather than simply better pay and conditions? That's a major challenge. He's not here tonight, but a colleague, Keith Breen, does a lot of uh, work on what about the internal goods of labour? In other words, that you engage in labour not just for the income that you get out of it at the end of the week or the month, but the intrinsic joy of working on something either together or on your own. I mean, it's telling that in orthodox capitalist economics, what I was taught in UCD many, many years ago, work is seen as disutility. Wages are your compensation for the disutility you feel while working. Well, why not try and create more utility in work, more autonomy in work, some creativity, beauty in the work conditions? These are ideas that weren't seen so crazy 40 years ago. Even hearing myself say them, here in 2014, it sounds so old. It shows you how far our political debate has become degraded in terms of the opportunities available to us. And I also think that democratising work will help create a democratic society. This is definitely in reference to uh, Alexis de Tocqueville. In other words, beyond simply a democratic system, why should democracy enter the factory gate or the lecture theatre door? Give citizens in a work situation, more experience of autonomy, of conflict resolution. This will help create a more democratic, and I would say vibrant and healthy society. These are some examples. We've got the Belfast Cleaning Cooperative. This is a fantastic pamphlet that was produced by Trademark. And Mondragon, of course, is the, it's like Sweden for social democrats. Mondragon is the classic, massive Spanish, cooperatively organized institute uh, in terms of banking, production, uh, and so on. And they have faces. This is what worker democracy looks like. What about considering that as a way to create a less unsustainable and more just world? And what about, I see William in the audience and others, reform the monetary system? I won't go into the complete details of this, but essentially all the money we create in our society is private money, that's essentially issued as debt. And the financial institutions, the financial sector of our economy is parasitic on the manufacturing and the real economy. There's Ella Kilter, another form of disembedding. And I think for a sustainable post-growth society, we have to issue the money in terms of a public institution, the state. I think banks, private banks, would be prohibited from creating money and issuing it as debt. And finally, what about quantitative easing for the people, as opposed to particular sections of the economy? But the reasons, just to recap, why the capitalist economy is locked into this ecocidal growth path. States are planning their expenditure that the economy will grow. Companies are legally obliged. There's a fiduciary duty on corporate financial officers and CEOs to get the best return for their shareholders. And of course, when you create money as debt, it bears interest, which means you've got to get back more money than you lent. So therefore, there's an implicit dynamic that the economy has to grow. But here's a radical idea. What would an economy look like if it was designed by a scientist with some basic understanding of the laws of thermodynamics and ecology as opposed to a neoclassical economist? And that's our decisions. I think this is a situation we stand at as a society and a civilization. It's the equivalent of St. Augustine's view of make me chaste but not yet, where we all want to be sustainable. I mean, we have loads of evidence in terms of surveys of people wanting to be you know, more sustainable and green. We don't see much action often. It's a bit like the Irish football team, as many of you heard me say before, great on paper, crap on grass. <laughs> <laughs> so just to begin to wrap up, what's this got the connection with carbon and, and oil? 
It literally is the fuel of the capitalist economy. And again, many of you have heard me say this before at versions of this talk that I seem to have been given for the past 20 years. Name me one thing in this room, one thing, that isn't made in whole or part, or transported in whole or part without the use of oil or coal or gas. We built an entire industrial civilization on a non renewable, climate changing energy source. And moving away from that is the biggest challenge, or one of the biggest challenges in the transition from unsustainability. Oh, and it also causes wars. And this is the situation we're in. We've now reached the stage of extracting the maximum amount of oil in the planet's surface. Although Stefan, who's smiling, Riley, my colleague, we have debates whether or not fracking will extend this particular uh, scenario. And the issue isn't really when this point of maximum extraction happens. It's something we'll only ever see in the rear view mirror. Because at some point, it's a geological fact. Ever since we dug the first coal out of the ground or barrel of oil, we've already begun to degrade the resource because it's non-renewable. And yet we've built this society on this non-renewable, climate-changing resource. And it's us that have done it. Again, one of these maps adjusted to give the accurate <coughs> description of the oil used. It's in the minority world, even Japan. Not in Africa, South America or even China and India. It's a small portion of the human family that have gorged themselves on oil to create a high consumption society that's now causing climate change. And this is a very serious situation politically, certainly for our, the island of Ireland or Northern Ireland. We are very energy dependent and vulnerable. We're at the end of the pipeline in terms of a lot of these supplies of carbon. And the reality is this though, is that the climate change reports from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change tells us that we have corporations with five times more oil and coal reserves and gas than we think it's safe to burn. If you actually look at the financial dynamics in terms of investment and capitalization in these large energy corporations, they are betting we're going to fry the planet. That's the great thing about capitalism. You can fry the planet, engage in an ecocidal course of rivet popping the planet's life defense systems, and still make money. And this is the real challenge. How can we leave oil before oil leaves us? Is there any climate skeptics out there? But it gets better or worse, depending on your analysis, is that literally energy is the driving force of the economy. In other words, the economy is dependent upon the available energy. So there are serious crunches and limits if we don't have energy cheaply and securely available to us. And particularly this point here, is that when an economy starts spending more than 5% of its budget, and we in Northern Ireland, John Woods here probably know the figure, probably more than 5%, you can tip the economy into a recession. As an example of that, you can have a graph here that correlates US recessions in the peaks of the price, the real price of oil. It doesn't always happen, but invariably there is a relationship between the peaking of oil and the US economy going into recession. But how can we still explain that this ecocidal system is still enthusiastically supported within society? In fact, it's being promoted within universities. We hear it in our news broadcast on the radio. And I think part of the, the reason for this is that we have to accept those who are radical, like me, is that people like this system. They may be locked into it, but they actually like it, and therefore that makes it a compelling case for how do we begin to challenge that. I think you can begin by saying, well, what is it about the construction of this myth, of this new common sense that we need to analyze in terms of economic growth? Which leads me to my academic work on actually looking at why consumerism and economic growth are our new modern myths. Our identities are tied up, our aspirations 
are tied up in this new myth. In the same way that every society, because we're narrative beings, we, like, we tell stories to ourselves. And the story our society tells to itself is one around endless economic growth. This is where any liberals in the, in the room maybe get a very twitchy, because Plato wasn't a Democrat. But those of you who've read Plato's Republic, and some of you perhaps haven't, it's the idea that the philosopher, he's outside the cave, he's got access to, to knowledge, and he's been set free of the shadows. So in other words, what people think is real, this is the ordinary world that most people isn't actually real, the philosopher knows. Now there are many dangers in this, because it can lead into a very anti-democratic, where experts will tell us how to live and so on. But for me, I read a modern version of Plato's allegory of the cave as the obligation of those of us who are privileged knowledge workers who do have access and the time and the luxury to be able to think about these things and what's our contribution uh, in this time of crisis. And particularly we to see this even in climate activism. How radical is that, Sammy Wilson? <laughs> but what we get as a response to unsustainability is this business as usual approach, the continuation of technological solutions. And this has minimal, as I mentioned before, political and ethical input. And essentially it's a vision of the future that's a greening of what we have with better apps. And we tend to project into the future that it's going to be like the way it is today, but slightly better. And particularly for me, this techno-optimistic approach, and again, I'm not a Luddite, but I am drawing into sharp relief the way in which technological solutions by themselves rob us of the political opportunity to really restructure society, look at the ethical issues that underlie the way society is organised. And I think it's time to get radical in that Latin sense of the term of getting to the roots of something, no longer being content with end of pipe solutions. Design out problems. We shouldn't need laws against the inclusion of toxic materials in the substances that we buy. That is a design failure. We should be designing out aspects of our economy which are causing all of these problems some of which I've mentioned. I think it's time for disruptive politics. And particularly this last point, I'm always amazed that even in the academy, we tend to view entrepreneurship and innovation very technical and also in a business, commercial sense. Well, what about innovation and new ways of living? in political innovation and democratisation, workers' cooperatives, why isn't that seen on Invest NI's agenda, for example, as one of the public institutions charged with promoting innovation and entrepreneurship? And part of it is because of this issue of avoiding politics and ethics, but also it's about sustaining the unsustainable. I'm so radical, I don't want a green version of what we have at the moment a low carbon version of an inequality producing and human flourishing denying type of society. I think we can think bigger and better than that. And we don't need any new technologies necessarily. What then is the political will and the courage to do so? But key to all of this, it has to be a just transition. We cannot have the transition to unsustain away from unsustainability without attending to the issues of justice and injustice, as I mentioned at the start. And I think this is, for me, uh, the go to the issue of the academic side of this debate. It's about a new form of mission-led research, that we have a major challenge in society, in the world. And this is an, an appeal for a type of mission-led academic research agenda. It's explicitly interdisciplinary. No one discipline has the solutions. It's transdisciplinary, which I'm understanding as it's engaged. You have to go outside the academy, and not just to where academics usually go, or are encouraged to go, which is to business. But what about going to civil society, going to citizens, asking citizens what do they want from academics? We're upstreaming citizen involvement in academic research. And I think it's about encouraging an academic mode of research that is emancipatory. You know, partly on the back of that idea that knowledge will set you free, but at least to let people realise 
the contradictions in our society, the possibilities that are there, rather than accepting this myth of this new common sense that I've mentioned. And this is a post-normal science, for those of you who might be interested in this. It's about where facts and values come together. We have to show our knowledge, show how we've come to our, our, our perspective in public. This is called extended peer review, and it's very important in the climate change debate. But it's also beyond disinterested knowledge production. It is interested knowledge in making the world a better place, in challenging inequality, challenging injustice, challenging ignorance. And that's something that we haven't had in the academy in terms of a debate since the 1970s. And it's about generating an awareness of the contradictions of our society, debating whether or not the analysis I've given is even half correct or the third or the tenth correct. But let's not shy away from engaging in that debate about the analysis of the contradictions of society. And particularly, to use knowledge and knowledge production as a way for social trans transformation, and not just simply technological innovation. And this may be called, rather grandiosely, perhaps a Green New Deal for the academy, reclaiming the mission of science and social science <coughs> to improve the human condition. I think publicly funded research, we have an obligation those of us paid out of the public tax purse to give something back. And I, I do welcome developments in the management of academics in terms of impact uh, and so on, in terms of us demonstrating how our knowledge is making a difference. And particularly, as I say, upstreaming citizen involvement in terms of they're paying our wages. Now, they may not always be able to articulate exactly what it is that they want, but they should be included in some way in a way that they often aren't now. Well, in terms of education, and one of my great heroes, Paolo Ferreri, is that education can be used simply as a system of indoctrinating the young into accepting the current status quo. And because some of you here, like myself, send their children to a Steiner school, this is also Rudolf Steiner's perspective, that education can be stultifying and simply about imposing uh, an order on that which doesn't deserve to have an order imposed upon it. Or all education can be about liberation and emancipation. Again, even saying that now sounds so bizarre. Oh, there goes John again. <laughs> and what is it about our deracinated political imagination that we cannot even talk about these more radical ideas in the academy? And if you don't want Ferrari, take the Deering Report from 1997, which encourages us to have a view of the academy and education as part of a democratic culture. It's a pity Stephen Farry isn't here who's going to bring down cuts upon us. So, to conclude, this system of capitalism has locked us into an ecocidal, irrational economic system. It's past the threshold beyond which is actually adding to human flourishing, locked us into debt based consumerism, and it has made it a permanent feature of the economy that which should only be seen as temporary and a transition phase in human development cooking the planet, creating geopolitical instability, and it's undermined the possibilities of human flourishing for future generations. So we need system change, not climate change. <laughs> <laughs> and I think Wilkinson and Pickett hit it on the, the head. That is not an anti-growth message. It's to say growth has done its job. We should pat it on the head and move on to a different paradigm of the human economy and human development. So we need a paradigm shift in how we think about the economy and economics. I've outlined some of the arguments we can have about replacing economic growth with economic security. And in particular, we should be focusing the academy, our technological innovation, human creativity, on improving not the ecological efficiency of economic growth, that's where the vast majority of research is spent by research councils, by the R&D of companies. But why don't we focus improving the ecological efficiency of human flourishing, not necessarily economic growth? I think there are three ors that we're going to have to get used to in thinking about this paradigm shift. Reduction, redundancy and resilience. We could solve energy problems by reducing and stopping wasting so much energy rather than 
always focusing on the increase of supply. Redundancy is a technical term that anybody with any connection with the land would know. You don't max out the land in terms of fertilizers and growing more crops. You need to lay, lay it fallow. So you build in redundancy so it has a capacity to regenerate. I mean, to reduce resource use rather than simply try and decouple it. And one of the best things in life really are free. And ask ourselves that question that we don't often ask. Is something desired because it's good or good because it's desired and it's marketed to be desired? We need to be aware of thresholds. Again, move to economic security. And it has to be a just transition so that there isn't inequality as part of this transition. These are all my friends from Friends of the Earth. There's Dr. Foe. We've got a clash, the deep political ethical clashes between the choices we make in terms of how we want to live our lives. So I offer you a vision of radical hope. I haven't given you a lot of the answers, and this is Jonathan Lear, who wrote a wonderful book on the idea of radical hope. It's about anticipating a good which those who have the hope, we lack the appropriate cons, we don't even know often exactly what it is that we desire. Hence my focus on injustice and unsustainability. And particularly in terms of both the academic work but also political activism, our job as radicals, in my view, is to make hope possible rather than despair convincing. And to finish, there are no ecological limits as far as I know to these things. And this, to my mind, is the good stuff of human society and life. And where do we see a serious debate around this in terms of making this transition from unsustainability? And these technological approaches that we often see to unsustainability, they rob us again of the opportunity to see that there is an upside to down. The crisis we're in can be an opportunity not just to create a greener version of what we have, but a better society, one with higher levels of social quality, solidarity, and forms of human flourishing. But to do this, we have to be unreasonable. As George Bernard Shaw said, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. So let's be unreasonable. Thank you.